Point Blank is a crime fiction podcast. It may not be suitable for all listeners. We discuss violence in all its forms. The works we reference may include period slang, which some listeners may find offensive. The hosts also have a tendency to swear. Hardboiled, noir, detective fiction. This is Point Blank. Episode 4, Scorpion Reef, by Charles Williams. Hello and welcome to Point Blank. My name is Kurt and joining me as always, my co-host, the Sherlock to my Watson, Justin. Well, I think that's overplaying it there, but uh, thank you so much. Um, Justin is here reporting for duty. Yeah, how are you doing today, Justin? Pretty well. Uh, This is our fourth and final day together in Albuquerque recording the first four episodes. So I'm really uh, looking forward to knocking out uh, Scorpion Reef and and going back and seeing what this all uh, looks like uh, after the editing process. That being said, I'm feeling pretty well. I got a good night's sleep. I was watching... uh, one of the episodes of the newly rebooted Mystery Science Theater 3000 last night and promptly fell asleep about one hour in. That has nothing to do with the quality of the new MST reboot. I, I've actually come to love it, and I'm really thankful that they uh, started that Kickstarter for that reboot. The new episodes are mostly great uh, to good, and uh, last night was no exception. I think I just got tuckered out from all of this podcasting. Yeah, it was funny to see you fall asleep during uh, during the movie. We were watching what the many loves of Hercules. Yes, and there there were many, and Hercules was a complete and utter moron. <laughs> yeah, yes, he was, and also a a former husband to Jane Mansfield. And the funniest thing about the whole thing, I thought, is that uh, at the time of the filming of the movie, they were married, and their kissing in the in their in this film looks absolutely terrible. So it was it was utterly stilted, and it, it looked like. Well, like a brother and sister who who just learned the definition of kissing on Wikipedia, doing it for the first time. <laughs> really awkward. Oh, boy. And, and how about you, Kurt? How are you feeling on this Monday morning? I, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good that we've got, uh, you know, four episodes, the rough takes on them anyway, done. Yeah. Um, and it's been, uh, you know, it's been a long time getting this, uh, the planning stages of this. So it feels good to actually get something recorded. I, I'm with you there. I'm really delighted that we've gotten this far and we haven't throttled each other. Uh, I feel like the content has been interesting, uh, and I do hope that our readers ultimately or our listeners come to agree with us down the road when these are released. I'm looking forward to doing some camping tonight in the Manzano Mountains of central New Mexico, getting out of town a little bit before the hellfires of summer sweep everything away. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that, too. I haven't been camping since last summer, so if we get out even for the night, it'll be nice. All right. I do have um, two things I wanted to bring up, and uh, one's another podcast. Um, This is a true crime podcast, and again, this has been getting a lot of good reviews, a lot of good media about it, so you may have heard of it already, but just in case you haven't, uh, it's called Hollywood and Crime, and it is a true crime podcast, but one of the things that they do very well is they bring in voice actors to act out the roles of the people who were involved in this, and what this looks at is uh, 1940s Los Angeles, uh, 1947 is when it begins. And this is um, around the murders of uh, Elizabeth Short, probably better known as the Black Dahlia, um, which has certainly come up in a lot of noir, both fiction and film. And uh, it is fairly grisly. Um, This is, you know, there's plenty of trigger warnings on this particular podcast, uh, but they they do warn you about it. It's just very well done. They do get into trying to solve the case now. And, you know, there's probably no way to ever solve this at this point. But it's still interesting, nevertheless. Very good podcast. There's not that many uh, episodes out, so it's fairly easy to get caught up on. The uh, The other thing I wanted to just give you something to play around with, and this is for the writers out there. Uh, this is a it's an online app, a web based app. And um, it's called Story Beats, and it's at storybeats.io. 
And what you can do with this is play around with the, your your storyline. And what it does is it gives types, they use this uh, concept of story beat. So there's an upbeat, a lateral beat, a downbeat, or a mixed beat to the story. And as you lay out your scenes and stuff, you can kind of use this as a tool to make sure the flow of the plot has the right the right movement for you to kind of keep your your readers interested. Something to play around with. You know, this is not going to be like some kind of way to write a whole novel or something, but there's uh, videos on there. It's completely free. I guess it was designed as a some kind of design contest, so they put it together um, pretty quickly, but they it's kind of it's fun. And moving on into our reviews. And grab your pistols and your targets. It's time for five round burst. First up today, we have a classic from Charles Williams. This is The Hot Spot. It was also published as Hell Hath No Fury. In our main topic today, we're going to discuss Williams' uh, nautical noir, but this is more straight up uh, noir fiction. And what we have here is a, a character named Maddox who comes to town. Very soon, he robs a bank. That is just the beginning of the story. And from there, um, he's got a lot of tough choices and he's torn between two women and really giving anything away past the bank robbery here is ruining the suspense of this piece. This one is a hit for me. Moving on, we've got the second book of uh, the Happ and Leonard series. This is Mucho Mojo. This is by Joe R. Lansdale. And like the other book uh, in the series, I think this one's a hit as well. This one uh, really builds on the relationship between Happ and Leonard. And this uh, occurs after um, Leonard's uncle, Chester, has passed. And they're, again, early in the story of this one, they discover a body uh, hidden in the in a trunk under his Uncle Chester's basement. And this leads to finding out that Uncle Chester was fancied himself an amateur detective. And being a black man in East Texas in this time frame, having a dead body found under your uh, floorboards is not a great thing to have happen. So there is a lot of tension between the police and uh, Happen Leonard and all of this. And really, it's it's another good tale from Lansdale and just another solid hit in this series. And next up, we're taking a double shot uh, here. And what often happens when you take two shots at once is you have worse aim. And that is what happens here with the Pharaoh's uh, novels by Chris Ould. The first one is The Blood Strand, and the second is The Killing Bay. Uh, based on the title, you can tell that they're going to take place on the Pharaoh's Island. And I was drawn in by the setting. I thought that would be an interesting place. It is, for the most part. The author does a good job uh, with the setting for the, the most part. Um, the basic underlying story of this entire series is a family mystery uh, where the main character, uh, Jan uh, Reyna, who is a British detective, um, comes back to the Faroe Islands. He was he left there as a child, uh, so his father is still there. He's been estranged from him, and he comes back, and there is a whole bunch of family mystery type things to uncover. Now, the first one um, is is not bad. There's a a death that involves his family, and uncovering that is is pretty interesting. Um, he has a good relationship with a the local detective, and that plays out pretty well. Where this series really starts to fall apart is in book two. A few things. Uh, that are a problem. I would totally skip this, but I'm just going to say, uh, for one, the family mystery does not move forward enough in the second book. There's very little done. And the relationship between uh, Jan Reyna and that local detective whose pharaoh name I cannot pronounce at all uh, doesn't develop at all. They barely spend any time on the page together. And then the biggest sin in this book is that it involves environmental activists uh, because the pharaohs have a, a whale hunt. He uses that as the backdrop for this murder. And I'm just going to say not to get into the specifics of this, but he he fails as a writer to do his research and then properly uh, convey uh, the motivations of these activists of uh, who ultimately are accused of the murder. It, it just doesn't work. It's sloppy writing. I've seen this a number of times in crime fiction where the authors want to use activists as uh as perpetrators of the crime. And I don't have a problem with that, but I do have a problem when it is done sloppily and it's done very sloppily in this book. That is a miss. 
And last up for this episode selection, we have our nonfiction title, and that's Low Life by Luke Sante. And this is the subtitle of this is Lures and Snares of Old New York City. And this is really enjoyable if you like that uh, sort of urban history of like sort of outlaw history. This is a really great one that takes place in the history of New York City. There's all kinds of great information here on gambling, thugs, con men, pimps, madams. Crooked cops. Um, one of my favorite stories is of late 1800s gangs of kids who would control territory to put on plays and they would defend their territory by throwing stones at one another. So uh, that's a good one. This is a hit. It's it's a fun uh, history of uh, New York City's underbelly. And on to the main topic. And welcome to the main topic today. It's Scorpion Reef by Charles Williams. This is uh, one of Williams' books that's considered part of his Blue Water Noir um, series of books. And uh, what we get here is we get a gulf uh, of Mexico treasure suspense uh, blue water action story. All of that and more. Yeah, early in the book, we're introduced to the main character, Bill Manning. He is a ex-Navy diver. He's involved in salvage operations in uh, Louisiana. And very quickly, he's introduced to the character of Shannon McCauley. And she asks uh, Manning to come out to this cabin to find a, a gun that's been a, a fancy duck gun that's been dropped in the pond. Well, he thinks it's kind of ridiculous that he they need a professional diver to do this, but he is immediately uh, caught by Shannon McCauley's beauty, and he gets uh, roped into this. Anyway, he goes out there, and he does find the gun. The gun has clearly been a plant, and he wants to know what's up. At first, he thinks this is Shannon trying to seduce him, but a couple of thugs show up, and uh, they get into fisticuffs, and... Manning does put the beat down on one of the thugs, and then another one pulls a, a gun and stops the whole operation. We'll see these thugs again, but what this uh, scene happens to do is it gives us an opportunity to know that more is going on. After they leave, uh, we find out what the real plot of this book is going to be and why Shannon invited Manning out to find the gun. It was all a test, because what she really needs is she needs this man of action who has nautical knowledge to help her and her husband get out of town, escape to Central America, and on the way, find a down plane that has crashed underwater and has money on board. Well, Manning is considering what to do here. He goes back to where he lives on board a boat down by the water. He gets into a fight with a thug. It's an all, all in out fight, and Manning ends up killing the other thug. There's a great scene here where he has to hide the body, and he realizes that he's got to be on the run, not just from the police, but from the fact that these gangsters are going to be after him uh, if they find out he's killed one of their own. Now we get into a part of the book where things get kind of complicated with how do they set up this escape from Louisiana. He has to find a boat. They have to get the husband who's in hiding in their, in their home, supposedly a secret room or something, out uh, into this boat. Meanwhile, the house is being watched by these thugs that we were introduced to earlier. Most notably, the kind of mastermind of this group who is a character named Barclay. Well, this uh, they set up a rather elaborate scheme to get them out. That plot goes wrong, the husband ends up dead, and we're only halfway through the book. We also find out that it's not cash on board this plane that they're looking for, it's diamonds. And the diamonds have a much greater value than the cash, which was the original prize. Well, they try to get the husband out. That goes wrong, as I said. And we end up with two of the main thugs, Joey Barkley and George Bayfield, escorting Bill Manning and Shannon McCauley down to the boat that Bill has prepared. They take off into the Gulf, the four of them. And really what happens now is a fight for survival at sea where Bill and Shannon have to uh, fight because they know once they've located, if they can even locate this plane with the diamonds, um, their lives will be at an end. From there, we get into something of a deliberately ambiguous ending, and I don't want to give that away because you this is one of the lesser known books we've talked about. And um, 
for the faults of this book, the ending kind of makes up for it. But this is a great example of an author I personally really like, Charles Williams, and these books that he did that were his blue water noir books. And just to give you an idea of what these titles are, is we have a Scorpion Reef, a Ground, the Silk Clock Shroud, Dead Calm, and the Deep Blue Sea. And these came out between 1960 and 1971. Well, this was the second Charles Williams book I read, and I would not have known anything about Charles Williams, this particular author, the American author Charles Williams, as opposed to as opposed to the one in the UK who writes about Christianity and fantasy or something. This guy was unknown to me until Kurt introduced me to him, and I read and, and the Deep Blue Sea, and then I read Scorpion Reef, and I love the water stuff. I love the concept of blue water noir. I think the blue water, like we were speaking about in our last episode, um, implies isolation and sort of limits what our characters are capable of once they get out to sea. In the case of this book, I have some things I really like about it and some criticisms. One of the criticisms is that it takes so long to get to the sea that we don't really get to have that isolation feeling until really the last third of the book. But I have a couple of things I want to mention about this book that I think I liked, and then we can maybe start in with the author introduction, get to know a little bit more about Chuck Williams. Yeah, let's both just give it our quick rating here. Just a Sure, sure. I would say I love the first half. I don't love the second half. I give this three and a half kill shots out of five for that reason. Ooh, that's a little lower than I thought you were going to go, Justin. Uh Uh-huh. Provocative. Well, that's okay. Um, It's difficult. See, I give this a five, but that's a very personal rating for this. And there's a number of reasons for that. One, I do see problems with this book. Don't get me wrong on that. And, you know, really, if I want to take, try to take my own personal things out, this is probably maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe it's a close to a four, but not quite a four. But for me, I, I've read most of these Blue Water Noir series. It's very difficult for me to differentiate individual books out of that part of his his work. I mean, uh, Williams did write like 21 novels or so, and this is a small bit of his work. I am a big fan of nautical fiction, but a lot of it is really bad, quite frankly. And um, this was new to me, and there's some things that Williams does in here that, for me— bring it to the next level. And we'll talk about that a little later. I I mean, I think that down the road, once I read more of Charles Williams work, I'll be able to tease out a fuller understanding of his strengths and weaknesses. And I know that I tend to be a little harder on writers who revert to some of the hard boiled cliches, two dimensionality, and maybe more of the man of action stuff without the sentimentality or complexity of say a character like Philip Marlowe, I feel like I might be a harder grader in some of these more straightforward uh, action stories. That being said, I, I do think Charles Williams does some interesting things. And I really think we should know a little bit and explain to our readers more about who is this guy? Uh, not many people know about him. He has a legacy that is a legacy that is underexplored. Yeah. He's an interesting author because he's definitely the first one that we were talking about that isn't a big name. But when you start reading some of the critics of this era and this type of fiction, he's a consistent name that you see people saying, well, this is the one who's underappreciated. This is the one. This is the guy who should be in print who isn't. Yeah, I have a quote here from a John or not a quote, but a paraphrase. John D. McDonald, who came to be known as a, a classic hard boiled slash noir novelist in South Florida, he cites Charles Williams as one of the most undeservedly neglected writers of his generation. And that's saying something because both of them wrote at the same time. They both wrote for gold medal books. And John D. MacDonald, I believe, has a legacy that's a little bit stronger and a little bit better established than Charles Williams. And he's trying to help a friend out, but also recognizing talent when he sees it. Yeah, we do know um, a little bit about Williams. There's only one biography of him. And unfortunately, that was written in Spanish uh, and has never been translated. He was big in, in, in Europe. Um, and had a cl- much more acclaim there than here. But we know he was born in 1909 in Texas. Uh, he would die in 1975 in California. And notable to this story is that he joined the Merchant Marine in 1929, um, just at the start of the Depression. And he would work in the Merchant Marine for 10 years uh, before he would marry and come ashore and continue to work around the Marine industry He was a radio operator aboard ships, and then he would work for radio marine companies 
mostly up and down the West Coast um, until he really took off as a writer. I have a question. Um, as a man of the sea, somebody who's worked on boats for many years, have you heard of anybody who operates in the shipping industry who reads or knows anything about Charles Williams? Does he have more of a following by people who work in the ocean or is that really not something you've been able to detect? No, I, I mean, no, I've never seen him come up. In, I mean, I've looked at a lot of lists of nautical books, nautical fiction, nonfiction uh, authors to read. <laughs> And especially there are some professional forums that I'm involved in. And occasionally, because we do have time to read books when we're on the boat, people will bring up like, who's somebody you should be reading? I've never seen his name come up. And usually the sailors who do read, if they find out an author has worked as a merchant mariner, they're much more likely to check him out. Sure, sure. And I think Charles Williams brings some interesting things to the table. One, his twelve or his 20 years as a merchant marine and as a radio engineer the fact that he didn't start writing until his 40s, uh, meaning that he, he valued experience over prodigy writer uh, of youth who, who gets his career going early. Uh, I think these things lended themselves to his uh, technical expertise and his ability to really get into his characters in a way that some crime writers sort of overlook. And I think that's why for me in the rating category, he is is high for me is because I read what he writes about boats and the sea, and it's right. And that's done wrong so often that I'm putting it up on a pedestal just for that reason. I think that's fair enough. And me being essentially ignorant of the technical aspects of boating, I can't tell the difference. Uh, it all sounds pretty good. Uh, I, bu I buy into it. He doesn't sound sloppy when he's when he's conveying technical information. It sounds right, but I can't say for sure. So I'm a little bit immune to, to being wowed by that technical mastery. But to hear you say it, you know, maybe I'll reassess him after I read a few more books and come to understand more fully his prowess. Well, let's move uh, let's move into this book a little bit more closely. And you want to take a look at the, our main characters here? Sure, I think so. Um, unlike some of the books we've been reading, this novel is a little more concise in that we have fewer characters to work with. Characters tend to recur over and over again. The bad guys don't keep coming in out of the woodwork from different sources. We get certain bad guys. We get the certain good guys. We get the femme fatale or maybe just the femme, depending on how you look at the main female character. But um, most importantly, let's start off with Bill William Manning. He is a salvage diver, a former Navy man. He spent three years at MIT, so we know he's got some smarts, particularly in the technical regions. And he's a tough guy with apparently obsessive romantic tendencies, both for women and perhaps for boats. He's an interesting main character. I I can't say I loved him the way I love some main characters, but I think he was compelling. And this is a first person narrative. So we really get inside his head a little bit. He has some compulsion tendencies, uh, but he also has a, a certain sort of hard boiled way of speaking that's engaging and pulled me in and dragged me along. Though he, I wouldn't argue, is the main plot generator in this story. Uh, I think it's more the Swede or um, uh, what's her name? Shannon uh, McCauley. Shannon McCauley, who really drives the story forward, whereas Bill Manning sometimes acts as window dressing or just sort of follows along at her various whims and, and desires. That being said, uh, what did you think about Bill Manning as a character? Well, I, I mean, I think you're right. I don't think, I mean, I think he's an interesting character to some degree, but he is not necessarily, always, he drives elements of the plot, but no, he's a following Shannon. Sure. Um, I do think, and I think this is true of a lot of Williams fiction that I think you can accuse him rightfully of writing a Mary Sue type character based on his background. Like all of his characters have happened to have been in the Navy or the merchant Marine in the same period that he was. And they all have the same fascination with sailing that he does, at least in many of the books I've read. So yeah, I think he's kind of this idealized. He's a MIT guy. Who's a, didn't quite finish because he went into the war and then he became a Navy diver. And I think there's somewhere he's probably a boxer as well. And, yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. You know, a little bit of a, a Hemingway tough guy who happens to be both handsome, rugged, uh, f physically uh, capable, technologically knowledgeable. He, he, he seems to be the everything kind of guy. Yeah. And I mean, I think it is just, again, with this nautical suspense fiction, I think it is sort of like this idealized portrayal of the mariner 
I do think that that's kind of, I think that there's a lot of guys I work with who probably see themselves as this guy. <laughs> which, well, I mean, which, which speaks to the romance of this story. This is, a, this is a romantic novel in a lot of ways. One way being there's a lot of romanticization of the main characters, uh, romance of the boat, romance of the sea. I mean, for some writers, I think I read somewhere that one of the writers called Charles Williams not sentimental. And while he might not be sentimental in the sense of maybe Ray Chandler when he's really loaded, he does romant he has he definitely has a romantic relationship with the ocean and he does tend to exaggerate certain elements of human attributes for the sake of embellishment to I, I don't know why. Maybe it's because he knows his readership. I mean, who's reading these books? This is a men's romance novel, really. I mean, in many ways. It's a suspense novel, and that's why we're covering it. But there's a lot of romance elements in this because he falls this like head over heels for this woman. Uh, Shannon, let's talk about her in just a minute. Yeah. But Manning is also in love with the boat. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's a scene there that I can't remember. He wants to make love to this sailboat. And I kind of get that. <laughs> so he, he's he's in love but with Shannon. But Shannon is interesting. And the way Williams writes Shannon is interesting because she comes up with, I, I don't want to say all of, but she comes up with an equal amount of the plot of how they're going to get her husband out, like how this all moves and shakes. And she's not incompetent by any means. Shannon McCauley in this story is probably the most complex character, the most engaging, certainly the, the driver of the narrative. I think to an extent, she also has the romantic features of a woman who uh, might be idealized. He, she's consistently referred to in the story as the Swede, which is some kind of Charles Williams obsession. He tends to do this. Every every blonde woman in every story is the Swede. Uh, the funny thing, of course, is that she's a married woman of Irish Finnish descent. She's not Swedish, but she still gets the tag uh, because of Williams. We can't uh, know that, uh, the reasons why, but let's just go with it. She's the Swede. Here's a quote from the book that sort of explains how Bill Manning sees her, and uh, uh, we'll take it from there. She could make your breath catch in your throat. The bathing suit was black, and she didn't have a vestige of a tan. The clear, smooth blondness of her hit you almost physically. A few inches shorter, with the same build and the same legs, and she would have been downright voluptuous. As it was, there was something regal about her. I looked down and went on bailing. Bill Manning clearly sees something special in this woman. She's she's gorgeous. She's good looking. She's not quite voluptuous, which I guess is a way of saying that she's tall or, or something. But um, the the note that she's there's something regal about her speaks a lot to the way that Bill Manning sort of follows her around like a puppy dog the rest of the novel. She has a a queen like presence in the story. Not only is she smart cunning, sophisticated. She also has a romantic side. She's tender. She's a married woman who doesn't blatantly cheat on her husband in this with Bill early on. They they, they come to find romance together ultimately. But an interesting thing about Charles Williams with this female character, who at first, you know, sort of felt like a two-dimensional throwaway character, you know, sort of serving as chum to the to to the lust the lustiness of Bill Manning to his romantic urges, she ultimately is a little more developed than that. And um, there are some writers who claim, uh, one in particular, there's this essay called Five Noir Lessons by Ray Banks. And he mentions that Charles Williams is one of the few noir novelists of any generation in either gender to write complex, engaging female characters. Indeed, there's an argument to be made, Banks says, that Williams was more interested in his women than his men, that his men are actually largely defined by their relationships with women, and that the women are the ones who end up triumphant because they possess a self-awareness, intelligence, and crippled humanity that the men can only begin to know. What do you think about this? Well, I think it, I think there's some truth to that. Again, this is we have to look at it from a historical perspective because this book was, you know, when it came out. So I think when you compare it to that and then you add the elements of the genre that it's written in and when you look at those factors, then, yeah, I think we can say that he's he's doing something that's above above the average. Is it perfect? No. Does it meet our modern scrutiny? No. But for this time frame, is this good? Yeah. Um, we're not engaging in intersectional feminism, third wave feminism, not even second wave feminism. We're talking the early 60s here uh, and coming out of that sort of post post-war 50s perception of domesticity as the women's world and men going out 
and doing the jobs, that kind of perspective on the world. Is this a complex character uh, for, for what's essentially a men's romance? Definitely. I think she's dynamic. I think she's interesting. And she doesn't get as reduced as a lot of the characters in other stories of this genre. Well, let's move on to the other two characters who play some role in this in this fiction, because the ones who actually move the plot are pretty minimal. Uh, we've got Joey Barkley and George Barfield, the two thugs who end up on the boat with them. Barkley is what we'll, we'd call him uh, the more sophisticated of the two. So yeah. maybe the mastermind. Definitely. The mastermind. Yeah, he's got a suaveness to him. He, he comes across as educated. And, and, and Barfield, is that his name? Yeah. Yeah, he's more of the Mr. Fisticos, tough guy. Yeah, I don't think that there's a lot to say about Barfield here, but um, I do think Barclay is, there's a couple of things to note here that Williams did with Barclay that are important. And the most, the biggest one of that is he makes Barclay competent, professional, and he also knows how to sail. And I think that would have been easy to overlook for a writer who wasn't familiar. You know, they're just the tough guys standing there with the gun on the deck and there's no way to get rid of them because on a, a small vessel like this, you're underway at night, you're sailing. If you know what you're doing, it wouldn't be that difficult over the course of day to get two guys to fall overboard. I mean, it, it's it really wouldn't be. Um, so Barkley knows how to navigate. He knows he can't be bullshitted um, during this. He's not quite at Manning's ability, but he's good enough that uh, it allows what could have been a major plot hole for me to, to be filled. Yeah. I mean, in a book like this, you need to have, you need to ramp up the the tension. The conflict needs to be a legitimate conflict. If you see the villain as a paper tiger, somebody who, who looks the part, but doesn't actually have any, any meat can actually uh, compete with you uh, intellectually or physically, then you're not going to really feel the fear. And it's the fear, the terror, uh, especially in, in an isolated situation in the sea, uh, when you actually start to worry for your hero and 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 question whether or not they're going to survive. In this case, the uh, the ending gets interesting here, and we there are a lot of twists and turns. But ultimately, never on the boat did I assume that the the route out for our protagonist was going to be easy. Uh, Justin, do we have a Puss Walgreen Award for this uh, this book? You know, I, this one was tricky because we have s- such a limited number of characters and. The characters we do have, not many of them have, their names are pretty standard or, or they go unnamed, such as with the husband of Mrs. Macaulay, who, though we tried to find his name, he tends to be referred to as Mr. Macaulay or Macaulay or the dead husband. But I think if we were to pick one Puss Walgreen from this book, it would have to be. I'm sorry, but it's got to be the ballerina. It's the name of the boat, folks. It's a dumb name for a boat. It also speaks a little bit to Bill Manning's romantic uh, engagement with a watercraft. (laughs) He speaks of her very lovingly, very longingly. He touches her very fondly. He really gets to know her before they start their relationship. And then, uh, you know, she she helps him through and through and actually helps him escape in the end. Not to spoil the ending, but, you know, she's there for him. They are on the boat two thirds of the way through the book. So we know they have to get away somehow. There are not enough characters here to really spend tons of time on them. And I think we've covered the bases with the Swede and Bill in our plot theme style setting section. I think it would be interesting to spend some more time exploring the ways that Charles Williams refers to the sea and nautical technology and how he incorporates these uh, sort of unique specialized pieces of knowledge into his fiction effectively or ineffectively, depending on, on your point of view. You know, I assume, Curd, you're going to have a lot of thoughts on this as, as, a, as a boatman uh, who's familiar with the, with the tech. I will say this. I think it it's something that draws me to Williams. It makes me want to read more. Even if his characters were cut out, I want to see how he conveys the sea and draws meaning from it and uses uh, this sort of specialized description of technology that I have no interest or familiarity with uh, in a way that compels me. Well, yeah, I, I am definitely drawn to... Th- general fiction from the sea. And I think it's a very difficult setting for a writer to use properly because you tend to see books. I mean, some of the best books on a lot of people's best books ever written lists come from the sea. I mean, we've got things like Moby Dick or the heart of darkness or um, 
Lord Jim or... Old Man in the Sea. The, the sea as a character. The sea as a foe, sort of the man against nature type of uh, trope. It's not uncommon. Yeah, it's it's very... Or, or even just in a real life event. Like think of the story of the Titanic. There's a reason why that is still holds so much weight. I mean, it's not... I mean, it is in part that so many people died, but it's also because of the vessel, the isolation, the elements that they're exposed to that we remember that story. So from a suspense point of view, like, yeah, it's great because you can put your characters in a very isolated space and not give them any resource outside resources to deal with the situation. One of Williams' other, other books that I've uh, really enjoyed is Ground. And a good portion of that book happens with a s- smaller sailboat again, stuck on a reef, and a sand spit that has nothing on it. And not to give anything from that away, but he does, I think, a very good job of getting a whole novel with very little setting. I mean, there's there's a setup to that, I mean, before that, but the bulk of the novel takes place with just those elements. And that, to me, sounds a lot like a like a locked door mystery, the, the kind of isolation necessary to, to sort of figure out what the crime is in the classic cozies of Agatha Christie, etc. Of course, uh, it's a little more windswept, rugged, and... and dangerous of a setting which is which is an allure but i like that idea of creating isolation and seeing what happens with the characters in that room essentially the way that tensions can be ramped up and suspense can be increased because you don't have you you there's no reliance on some kind of deus ex machina extra characters coming in sweeping in to save the day or when the plot starts to sag you you bring in some more characters that shake things up. Those options aren't really available when you're isolated like that, and and it and it can create for really a uh, riveting reading. I will say this though: as much as I wanted him to get to see, I yearned for it from the start of this book, from the title Scorpion Reef. You know, the scorpions reef. It sounds exciting. It's enticing. It sounds like danger. There's a picture of a man underwater on the front of of the book. Uh, it isn't until about 59% through the book that we actually get out into the goddamn ocean. And it, it was driving me crazy. I loved the tension and I loved as the as the plot developed in the first half. But we don't actually get into the water into the latter half. And I was a little bit disappointed in this because I do love and I want to be in that environment. I want to be surrounded by water. Water as mystery, as depth, as danger. Those are things that are compelling to me. So that was a little bit of a letdown. But once we do get there and we do get to know the boat long before that, I, you know, I definitely feel like I'm there with them. Yeah, and I, I get that. I, but I think part of a nautical story is often getting underway. And I, I, I don't think he does it. That, I mean, I'm not saying that this is done well because I wanted to get to the ocean faster as well. But I do think that you see that sometimes in nautical fiction. Like I'm thinking for those familiar with the master and commander series, um, the Jack Albury books, there's entire books in there that don't actually take place on the sea. (laughs) It's the setup of getting boats ready and dealing with all those logistical issues and, and crap like that. As an avid boatsman, does all that prep excite you? Does it bring you back to, does it make you feel like you're at work or does it excite you in the ways that good reading about technical stuff can excite someone who who's drawn to that kind of stuff? Well, I mean, do I want to see a whole novel about it? No, but I have a pet peeve and you see this in movies all the time where they're either working for the sake of not work, you know, just to film something. They're doing things when things don't need to be needed. And then when there's elements of like, hey, They'd be doing a hell of a lot of work right now. They're not doing anything. You know, the classic is sort of like somebody saying land ho, and then all of a sudden they're like dropping the anchor. Well, I mean, that's going to be hours, uh, bef- you know, before you get there. And no, do we want to see that in the movie or do we want to read about that? No, but it it makes me feel like there's it's not being true to itself, to what the actual experience is. And the, all of this provisioning and preparing that he's doing, for me, that does kind of build a little bit of suspense because I know that he's he's anticipating this this hunt, this search. Sure. And if you know what he's doing, you know why he's doing it. And you also know and will be able to identify if he's under pressure, kind of things he might miss, that mistakes that could be made that could create problems down the road, I imagine. Yeah. And this speaks to William's ability to do technical suspense writing. And let me just go off on a little tangent here. If you're familiar with, I guess, what would be modern day, the modern day equivalent of this men's adventure suspense fiction on the water, the number one name is going to be Clive Cussler, whose name I can never say properly. 
But in his books, like my, I read them occasionally just because it's like the filler fluffy thing to read. He doesn't write really write the technical stuff very well. It's he drops a lot of technology. He drops a lot of makes and models of cars and guns and crap like that. But he doesn't write with authority on how to use any of those things. And Williams does that. And I want to bring in a different book, which is um, a book he wrote called Hot Stuff is what it's currently known as. It's also been published as Hell Has No Fury. I think that's a better name. Yes, it is a better name. They, they, the movie was called Hot Stuff, and the movie looks terrible. I did not watch it. But within this book, there's a scene where, and let's remember that Williams was basically an electrician. There's a scene where he has to change a battery on a car. And you would think that is incredibly boring, potentially. Absolutely. But Williams not only stretches this out for, I believe it's like 10 pages, which is a considerable part of the novel, but he builds suspense through the entire operation. And he does that, you know, as a competent writer of suspense, but also a competent person of explaining the technical aspects of what he's trying to do and why what is what he's trying to do is going wrong. And that comes from, um, I'm not certainly the first to notice this, and this uh, this comes from the essay, 15 Impressions of Charles Williams, which is found in the Big Book of Noir. Um, This essay is by Ed Gorman. He said one of the points that he makes is that Williams wrote in a definitive way about a wide variety of subjects. And I do think that you see that he's putting research into these dime, what's essentially a dime novel. And from personal experience, but also writing with a sense of, you know what this guy is talking about. And I guess in this case, as my profession is a sailor, when I see somebody writing about that work, that life, that preparation with that authority, I know that I trust a lot of the other things that he's writing in the book. And there's very few people who do that. There's, there's a reason why, for example, Joseph Conrad writes good nautical or excellent nautical fiction is because he was he was a sailor. He worked around the ports. It does make a difference in in any in any profession having that kind of basic knowledge and the fact that Charles Williams was like a, like we said forty two when he started writing at the professional level. I think that's uh, essential component of his abilities to uh, to succeed. Before we move on, I do think it's important that we spend a little bit of time discussing the ending. Or at least, at the very least, the frame of this book. And I know we might have different interpretations or or opinions of of how successful or not Williams was in pulling off this frame. But I think it's important to talk about because I think it's it's a sort of the key as to whether or not people are going to like or dislike this book, whether they buy into it. Do you you think we can do that for a couple minutes? Yes, let's do that. And let's remember that we're reading a journal that a captain is reading and that he doesn't really remind us of that through most of the book. But at the beginning of the of the story, we know that the, the text we're actually reading comes from this journal. Exactly. Chapters one and the final chapter are bookends. Uh, a captain comes onto an abandoned vessel in the Caribbean and comes across the the log, essentially the log book, in which he finds a well written first person memoir written by supposedly Bill talking about his meeting of the Swede, his purchase of the boat, and the whole story, including the fisticuffs, the violence, the murder, the bloodshed, the hostage taking, and ultimately the end result for the Swede and Bill. Now, I'm not sure to what extent I want to reveal the ending. I'm not sure if we should. I mean, we're not exactly a spoiler alert type of program if you're watching or listening to us. You should expect us to get into the the gritty details of the book not be surprised if we reveal anything. Well, but let's, let's not reveal the ending because okay. he's a little lesser known. Let's just say that there is a twist at the ending. There's a there's a twist at the ending. The frame might be uh, looked at by some as a gimmick, by others as a sort of a clever move on William's part. I think it's a little bit of both. And I think part of the reason I gave this book three and a half out of five stars is because while I, I like the setup of the log book, the story inside the story, it creates sort of a situation at the end that makes me question whether or not it's, it, it, the ending's cheap. 
You didn't have that impression to the same extent? Well, how cliche do you think this was in 1955? That's a good question. I'm not sure if this gimmick's been used before prior to that or after. Like, it feels gimmicky, but it's not exactly... It sort of feels like the end of a story where it's all just a dream. You wake up and uh, all the bad stuff didn't really happen. Or... You know, it creates this sort of ambiguous uh, mystery at the end that leaves the reader walking away going, huh, interesting. It's sort of clever in that we do know that Bill Manning did spend some time as a short story writer, this protagonist. He went to MIT. He was a sailor. He worked as a salvage diver. He also had several stories published. This is something that Charles Williams makes very clear to us at the beginning of the story. Probably, I'm assuming, to for us to sort of connect that to ultimately his journal writing and the way that he might embellish or exaggerate or fictionalize his accounts uh, in order to escape. Yeah, I, I know I can see that you have a problem with it. I, I don't. <laughs> I, I don't see this as, as perhaps as cliche as you do. And I also, to me, the more I think about it, the more interesting it makes the book for me. Because how much of the information, because this is, this is from Manning's point of view and with the conclusion of the book, how much of this information is accurate? It's a great question. This is a classic situation of an unreliable narrator. We don't know it at first, but ultimately, you know, some books, you, you walk away with a neutral taste in your mouth or you close the book and you're like, oh, that was good. And you move on. Some books make you think. And you know what? I might ultimately revisit my rating of this and up it a little bit because I think a lot about Scorpio Reef. When I'm forced to revisit the ending, the mystery is intact. I walk away going, what What about What about the story, if any of it was true? What is Tall Tale? What do I really know? Like, as we said, Bill's a short story writer. He's writing a story in the log. It sort of reminds me a little bit of The Usual Suspects. Um, not that the endings are parallel, but if you've seen that film starring Kevin Spacey, uh, and I'm not going to spoil it, but... You know, you get a really good, interesting, noirish crime story. But at the ending, there's some questions that are raised as to what of it is actually true and what is not. And that's what we're left with with Scorpion Reef. So in that regard, maybe it is groundbreaking and not cliche, and I'm in the wrong. Well, I don't know about that, but I do think the fact that we can have a good discussion about it is a compelling reason to read the book. I'm with you there. And I actually sort of want to revisit it again and, and sort of see if maybe I missed something. Maybe maybe Williams was planting clues all along that I overlooked in my first read. So, yeah, I guess the, if the sign of a good book is one that compels you to want to reread it or revisit it, uh, leaves you wondering exactly what was truth and what was not, uh, Scorpion Reef is, is, is worthy. I'd like to switch gears here. I want to talk a little bit about writer's craft. I want to refer back to that short essay written by Ray Banks on the five noir lessons from Charles Williams. Uh, in addition, I want to offer my choice cut uh, for this week, meaning um, one of the quotes from the book that really stood out to me as a quality example of Charles Williams' prose. This is from the first half of the book. It really stood out to me as, a, as an example of, of Williams' writing style and his, his knack for description. This is the first murder that occurs in the story. Bill gets into fisticuffs with a guy who has a vendetta against him, accidentally uh, knocks him off into the water. Uh, the guy doesn't survive. Williams goes down to try to uh, check on him or retrieve the body or something. And underwater at night in the dark, we get this passage. Quote, I was trying to get a grip on his shirt collar when I saw the plume of dark smoke drifting out of his head to thin out and disappear downstream in the tide. I reached around and put my hand on the back of it. It was like a broken bowl of gelatin. It goes on and on as he describes a sort of eerie underwater landscape. And, and then there's the moment of sort of recognition in the character that, that this man is dead and that he has something to do with it. It's a haunting little moment in the story. It sort of sets a tone for the death to come. Ray Banks reduced Charles Williams to the five following headings, the things that really stand out to him as a writer. Number one, and we've talked about this already, experience is essential. Williams was an author whose experience was lived rather than learned. He didn't go to college, learn a bunch of stuff, and then write some books about it. He worked the boats. He worked as a radio engineer. He struggled on the ground. He was a working class guy. Uh, and he was knowledgeable and he applied that knowledge to his writing. Banks writes 
that um, he displays an emotional palette far more uh, varied than most debuts right right off the bat. His first piece of writing was already fairly advanced and that his voice was professionally honed already because he had lived, he had learned, he had loved, he had lost, he had done all this stuff. And as a 42 year old, he had lived enough to translate that writing effectively in a way that had emotional residence and that well-honed craft. Number two is good sense of humor. Especially in noir fiction, we don't want to be bogged down with just the heaviness, the mood, the the violence, the depravity. You need to have that good sense of humor. Great tragedy, Ray Banks writes, relies on the same wicked timing that drives a great joke. And Williams does contain this. Moving on to the third point in the essay, which I've already said, keep it concise, and I will. That's why we couldn't find a good Puss Walgreen in this, this book here, because he... He mentions in the essay that Williams was careful to shove his small, intricately drawn casts into the most effective pressure cooker settings he could come up with. And I think, again, as we've talked about in the nautical setting, a boat alone at sea is a great pressure cooker. Absolutely. There are no loose threads in this book. There aren't characters that are introduced and then they disappear from the plot. What we have is what we get and the characters we start with get boiled down and boiled down until that pressure is ready to explode. Number four on the list is something we've already discussed, is that the femme is possibly more important than the fatale, that Charles Williams had a knack for writing more complex female characters than was the norm in the noir or crime fiction genre at the time. Now, he is not an intersectional feminist, but the character of Shannon Macaulay is pretty well developed. And lastly, appreciation has nothing to do with quality. And this might speak a little to the legacy, to our wrap up on Charles Williams, in that just because you don't know of Charles Williams doesn't mean he is not worthy to be read. Contemporary critics may hate to admit it, says Ray Banks, but literary criticism is a wide strung net and has a tendency to catch only the work that displays obvious literary value, the stylistic showboat, the controversial, the bleeding edge topical, while everything else drifts through into obscurity. This isn't always the fault of the author not being good. It sometimes timing is off. Sometimes you're writing in an era when writing of that of that caliber is not acceptable or that something else is happening in the in the social zeitgeist that's distracting people. Uh, for example, the Vietnam War might keep people from reading riveting blue water noir, just might not be on their minds. But that doesn't mean that the writing isn't good. And I think Car- Charles Williams is a great example of somebody who is going to gain more notoriety and recognition in the, as, in the years ahead. Yeah, and talking a little bit more about his legacy, I think he does suffer from the fact that uh, critic Jeffrey O'Brien mentioned about him. At face value, he's the epitome of the macho adventure writer. But that's, he's, I think he's saying face value there for a very important reason, because I think there is more to him than just your what looks like a men's adventure fiction writer. Um, we see that, you know, we've talked about the complexity of his female characters and his ability to do quality technical writing. And, um, you know, we don't know about him that much today, but, you know, he, he wrote 21 novels. Many of them, he doesn't have a standout novel, which might be another problem. He doesn't have what a lot of people would consider his five star novel. But the interesting thing about him is he doesn't have a two star novel either. And that's something we do see from a lot of our writers. You know, maybe they do have a classic, but they've also got a dud in there somewhere. Williams was consistent. And uh, he also did sell quite a few. I mean, he sold a lot of copies in his time. He sold millions of copies of books. He also did extremely well in Europe. And he had 12 uh, movie or television adaptions of his work. So it's not like he was totally unknown in his time either. So, yeah, I really do think Williams is worth a second look, and a lot of his work is available only as an ebook right now um, in print. Of course, you can find his paperbacks for relatively cheap because he just isn't well known. You can find first editions of his stuff for a couple of dollars, and he's worth a look. And if you're interested in authors, some other nautical fiction, because this is such a passion of mine, I do want to mention two things that kind of fit into the, to our category. One is uh, the book The Death Ship by B. Traven. B. Traven is probably best known for The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, which I certainly think fits into noir fiction. And uh, The Death Ship is probably one of the best, I guess I would call it working class nautical novels I've ever read. It's about a man who loses his documentation and he gets trapped on a death ship because he cannot leave because he doesn't have a passport. And uh, I'll leave it at there, but it's, it's a very good book. And I did want to mention something um, contemporary as well. And this is actually something I found um, through one of my professional groups 
that people were saying, hey, this guy writes like he's actually been there as well. And this is a, an author by the name of Artie McDermott. And the books are Deadly Straits, Deadly Crossing, and Deadly Coast. And uh, the main character here is actually a marine engineer. And while the plots are nothing super special, um, there is an authenticity to the maritime elements of this. And this gets into a lot of more contemporary issues of maritime uh, shipping, such as smuggling and slavery and uh, terrorism and stuff like that. So if, if this is something that you're interested in, um, it's something I recommend. Um, if you're not interested in nautical fiction, then you could probably avoid it. But Williams is certainly worth another look. And in the uh, essay by Ray Banks, he says that Williams wrote about adults in a time of teenagers. And in Ed Gorman's piece, 15 Impressions of Charles Williams, he says that Williams wrote about all of us, brothers and sisters, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, people unremarkable in any overt way, just fearful people, finally floating on daydreams and obstinate hope before the final darkness. And I do think for that regard, Williams is worth taking another look at. We're never going to see more of Charles Works. He's a guy that lived in the middle of the 20th century. He passed away by his own hand in the mid-70s following the death of his wife. So um, all he has now is uh, whether or not we're going to appreciate his legacy. And uh, I think the time is now to start to really putting him up on that pedestal. Subject, Subject on, 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 on,
um, rents are skyrocketing. There's a lot of st- potential stories about property, disenfranchised people, the people who are born in Seattle can not necessarily afford to stay in their hometown because people from other places are coming and driving them out. There's a lot of haves and have nots um, in the area. And, you know, for a modern piece of darker noir fiction or a detective piece, there's a lot of material um, to use there. You know, going back to that geography element, not only do we have the rain, which is really in some ways too cliche uh, of a thing about Seattle, but we have and we have a geographic element that it's there's a lot of hills. Um, the neighborhoods feel somewhat segregated by the geography, by the lakes, um, the inland lakes, as well as Puget Sound itself. And I think think that's critical to a nice setting where you can move the characters about the city. And the other element, and this was a driving force because I wasn't born there, I moved there. But for me, a big thing about the city is the ability to get out of it. While it's a major city and it's growing in, Seattle and Tacoma have definitely grown together. There's a lot of urban areas in here. Within a very short drive, you can get up into the mountains. You can get on an island that feels somewhat isolated. In many ways, using Washington or the Puget Sound area as a setting has a lot of parallels to the explosion and interest of Nordic noir. That's an interesting connection. Similar setting, similar, I guess, climatological features. But but I think another thing that makes me think noir when I think of a place like Seattle is not so much uh, what's happening in modern times, but the rich colonial and economic history of the region preceding Microsoft. It was a big logging industry. And um, I think something about that logging industry, just like with the mines, for example, in Red Harvest, this idea of organized labor and capital, the exploitation of land, the type of towns that popped up in those environments that sure lend themselves to the Western, but I think also lend themselves to that kind of gritty, lawless terrain that's ripe for noirish or, or hard-boiled stories. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the history of the city, I mean, it's only within the last couple of decades that it's getting this modern polish. Now, Seattle, you're right about the, the expansion into the West and the exploitation of resources. And the real reason that Seattle grew to what it was is, you know, it got a lot of its money from supplying the gold rush, the gateway to Alaska. And they still are pretty in a lot of ways, the gateway to Alaska. But it's also the Puget Sound area and Seattle in particular has also been a magnet for, I don't want to say eccentrics, but people who maybe didn't fit in elsewhere, which is why you, you know, you up until, you know, say the 90s, you have things like the grunge movement and all of this stuff. You know, going back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, you had intentional communities from all manner of the political spectrum, but particularly left-wing uh, type people making intentional communities in the area. There was a lot of labor disputes. It's one of the only cities in the country that had a general strike where all of where workers across many different industries struck, and there was a lot of tension because of that. They also have a, currently, they have a socialist uh, city council person. Do yes, we do. And I think maybe this is another reason why I'm projecting the Nordic noir elements into the area because you have a state and a city that have traditionally progressive values, but you have a lot of people who don't necessarily agree with those progressive values. And that's why, you know, as we record this, not that long ago, there was the the stabbing in Portland. We've had some of the same people who were extreme right wing people involved in, in Seattle as well. And, uh, those elements have always been there. So the question is, how how does a city that in general has at least tries, how do you deal with these people who don't necessarily want to see that type of progress? And that's a, a very common theme um, in the Scandinavian Nordic noir mysteries. I wonder if we'll see uh, in coming days or years a a noirish or, or hard-boiled style detective based in that region sort of exploring these types of issues because these issues aren't, aren't the kind that are going to disappear. Anytime. No, and it is interesting because I, I did a little bit of research. There are not a lot of noir novels written in Seattle or the Washington area, which actually kind of surprised me. I mean, there's mystery novels, don't get me wrong. 
There's also, I will say this, there's a, there's a historical fiction that's coming out exploring the, the, the era of lawlessness that preceded the modern times in the region. I recall a book that I read a couple of years ago called The Bully of Order by Brian Hart. Here's a quick little synopsis from Goodreads, just in case you're interested. Set in a logging town on the lawless Pacific coast of Washington state at the turn of the 20th century, a spellbinding novel of fate and redemption told with a muscular lyricism and filled with a cast of characters Shakespearean in, in scope, in which the lives of an ill-fated family are at the mercy, mercy of violent social and historical forces that tear them apart. Now, this is not a noir novel, but it is a rather grim novel. And the way that the story is written, the way that you really feel the the environment, that opp- oppressive, heavy, wet environment on top of, or in addition to a layer of oppressive human exploitation and arrival uh, to this sort of grim, lawless region uh, where pretty much the the bosses are in control of everything in the same way that that's the case in Deadwood. But it's told in a lyrical way that was just really captivating. And while I didn't love the book, I think it sort of sets a tone of how one might approach a noir novel set in the Pacific. You're right. The area has a ton of material for noir and detective fiction, both the modern elements of corporate corruption, technological corruption, the displacement of residents, the rising skyrocketing property values to the historic elements of let's remember that Seattle is actually the origin of the term Skid Row and that this was a this was a crazy frontier town at one point where drug use, prostitution, uh, labor disputes, it was a hideout for criminals and radicals of all shapes and sizes. And uh, if you're looking for a setting for a, a noir story, I think you could do a lot worse than that, this region. Thanks again for joining us. And we'd like to let you know about the works we have uh, coming up ahead. Next uh, episode, we will be covering Patricia Highsmith and Strangers on a Train. In episode six, we're going to be taking a look at Chester Himes' Real Cool Killers. And in episode seven, here's a little teaser for you who want to read ahead. We're going to actually be veering off away from the novel and and going back to the early origins of the hard-boiled genre by looking at the Black Mask Boys, Masters in the Hard-Boiled School of Detective Fiction by William F. Nolan. And this book uh, is a series of some of the early short stories that were published in Black Mask. And we're going to be reading these, talking about the early ways in which these stories were stylistically and thematically constructed. So stay tuned for that. On a... Final note, we do want to speak to the types of writers we've been discussing and the types of writers we will be discussing. Yeah, that's right. Uh, We just had a podcast here on what, you know, you could say is macho men's adventure fiction. And we just talked about a book called The Black Mask Boys. And we are conscious of the fact that we've been covering a lot of male authors so far in the show. And there's a couple of things about that. First of all, these are some of the best known authors in the genre. And we want to until episode 10, we want to cover those bases. And we're adding uh, Highsmith and Himes because one of them is not a man and the other one is not white. So once we get past 10, we want to add much more diversity uh, into our show and get into the real contemporary, classic, more obscure pieces of fiction. But for right now, we kind of got to cover these white guys. We just want to make it clear that we are aware of the people that we've been choosing. And um, if we make it past episode 10 and into the horizon, uh, we're going to really be jumping off the rails and exploring the lesser known nooks and crannies of all these genres. And again, if you have any recommendations or uh, advice as to uh, writers or pieces of work that you think you'd like us to cover, that's something we'd love to hear from you about. So you can reach out to us at pointblanknoir at gmail.com or check us out at our Facebook page, Point Blank Hard Boiled Noir and Detective Fiction. Uh, or you can check out our webpage, which is slowly, slowly developing into something that we want it to be. And that's pointblankpodcast.com. Yeah, that's right. Another challenge of uh, finding something, especially these early writers, female writers, a lot of them uh, wrote under male names. And that makes that research a little more uh, difficult. And scholars are just really starting to break the surface of that right now. So if you do know uh, a good source for those resources, please get in contact with us. We're going to continue to research. And if you like the show, 
Please give us a rating on iTunes. If you have constructive criticism, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, if you have a friend who enjoys this kind of fiction, let them know about the show. This week, we'd like to add a new segment to the show. There's a lot of bad mystery fiction out there. Let's be honest. There's a lot of stupid ideas. There's a lot of dumb characters. And each episode, we'll be coming up with a dumb idea for a mystery uh, piece of fiction. These are not copyrighted. You're welcome to run with these because we certainly don't want them. (laughs) That's right. And our first selection is entitled Checkmate, a Reggie Queen checkers mystery. Champion checker player by day, detective by night. Reggie Queen doesn't play by the rules. (laughs) I've got nothing. He's a double jump of action. (laughs) I've been punned out. (laughs) The story is never as clear as red and black. (laughs) Watch your back. Watch your back or you'll get jumped. (laughs) Say it one more time with less laughing. Watch your back or you'll get jumped. (laughs) Point Blank is under a Creative Commons license. Music is by Justin. Copywritten works are property of their respective holders.